Welcome to Trab's Talk for this week. I'm your host, Stephen Davis. We are joined by two very special guests this week. We're going to do things a little differently, though. Instead of a traditional interview setting and nine innings, nine hard-hitting questions for our guests, we're going to change it up a little bit. So let me introduce the guests first. We are joined by Michael Coffin, who is the radio voice of the Corpus Christi Hooks, Texas League affiliate of the Houston Astros, and Andrew Buckbinder, radio voice of the Springfield Cardinals, Texas League affiliate of the St. Louis Cardinals. Guys, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate the time. Oh, of course. Thanks, Stephen. Did you say hard hitting? Hard hitting is what we usually do. We're going a little softer and more lighthearted. Oh, you thank guys goodness. are perfect for this. Very good. All right. So what we're going to do, we are going to go through, and this was an exercise I did in the off season, and I'm going to have these guys shoot their holes in it for me and tell me what I did wrong. We're going to go through and make an all-star team of Texas League alums, a major league all-star team. And this is going to be based on how their big league careers have gone. So not the guys who were maybe necessarily the best or most dominant in the Texas League, although some of these guys were, but these are all guys who played in Little Rock. They played at Dickey Stevens Park, or in one case, we'll get to Ray Winder Field. But these are guys who all played in Little Rock. So that made a couple guys ineligible, but we'll get to that as we go through it. But what we're doing is we're picking one guy for each of the nine starting positions as if we were making a team. We'll pick a couple starting pitchers, a couple relief pitchers, and we'll talk about other guys that were considered for this as well. And Mike and Andrew are our expert panel because they saw all these guys to uh, say who really should have been on the team or if they agree with who I picked. Mike, Andrew, you ready to go through this? Let's do it. Yeah. All right, here we go. We're going to start with the most important position on the diamond in many people's opinion. Behind the plate, we'll start with catcher. And again, we'll stress this. These are guys who played in the Texas League on their way up. No guys who were on rehab assignments. So Yadier Molina, rehab assignment last year for Springfield against the Travs, ineligible. These are guys who had to have played on the way up, had to have played in Little Rock as a visiting or home player. And we're going to pick at least one guy from each franchise in the Texas League as well. So we'll talk about that as we go through it. But here we go. Catcher. My selection was Salvador Perez, longtime gold glover now for the Kansas City Royals and back from Tommy John surgery. He's a six-time All-Star, five-time gold glove winner. He's got a World Series MVP. There's some other good guys out there. Carson Kelly, who's now with the Diamondbacks, uh, has established himself after coming up through the Cardinals system. And Will Smith, unfortunately just injured with the Dodgers, is a hot up-and-coming guy. But uh, I got to believe Salvador Perez is a pretty good selection there. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I know you're a Royals guy, and uh, I, I love to give you a hard time, so I was really racking my brain to try to find a way that it wasn't going to be Salvador Perez. <laughs> no disrespect to Sal out there, but it, I think it is clearing away. I, I agree with you. Carson Kelly's got a, a tremendous future. He does a great job defensively, but what Salvador's been able to accomplish and, and accomplish right away upon getting to the big leagues um, kind of sets him apart for me. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's I think it's tough to look anywhere but Salvador Perez for this list, you know, and, and even, you know, you mentioned at the top, you know, you, you factor in obviously what they're doing currently in 2020, but but their legacy factors in as well. And uh, just looking at his resume, it's 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 tough not to, 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 to say Salvador Perez for this. All right. So we agree. Salvador Perez behind the plate and he is off to a, a great start here in this abbreviated 2020 season for the Royals. Now here where, is where things can really get tricky. Most catchers don't play other spots. They're just catchers. You get to these other positions now, you get some guys that play different spots. And the guy I picked at first base, and again, I made this list in the offseason, so it was coming into the year. I got Max Muncy of the Dodgers at first base. He played for the Midland Rockhounds in 2013 and 14 coming up. Muncie plays a lot of different spots. He's been playing a lot of third and second base this season, but he was the primary first baseman for L.A. last year. Great story. Wasn't a star by any means necessarily in the Texas League, although did win the home run derby at Dickey Stevens Park uh, in 2014 when the Trabs hosted the All-Star game, but has become a major power hitter now in the big leagues. Hard to pass on guys like C.J. Crone, even though he's out for the year with knee surgery, former Trab there. Eric Hosmer, Matt Olson with the A's and what he does on both sides of the ball. But uh, Max Muncy is my guy at first base. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, a great call for, for Muncy, just given his story. 
And, and as you described how he just kind of announced himself, you know, with the Dodgers, uh, given some pedestrian numbers in the Texas league, but really it seems like he's thrived there. And just, just to throw out alternates, you mentioned his name, you know, uh, given what he does with the glove, a guy like Matt Olson, two-time gold glove award winner off to a slow start this year offensively, but uh, it, he's, he's fun to watch as most of the guys on the Oakland A's. So I, I guess I would throw in uh, uh, an Olson in that, in that set for, for first base, for sure. Cra crazy to think that Midland on their run of four titles had Muncie at first base one year and then Olsen the next year. That's how good that A's system was in there. Pretty salty. Yeah, and Aliotti hitting 350 as well. <laughs> Anthony Aliotti, the, the forgotten batting champion for about five years in the Texas League. But I, I think, uh, Stephen, I think I would probably give my vote to Hosmer in this. I, I just think 10 years in the big leagues, um, you know, you're not losing anything defensively. You're probably gaining it at first base. Uh, everything I think that that nods to Sal Perez a minute ago that you that you rattled off. I think you can you can say about Hosmer and um, you know the 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 contract notwithstanding. And I think sometimes that raises expectations to to certain degrees. But uh, I think he's just been a, a a really really good first baseman in in the big leagues for ten years. And and if I were starting a team based on Texas League first baseman right now in, in Major League Baseball, I, I think of, of this group, I would probably go with them. Uh, who's the guy that likes former naturals who became Kansas City Royals? <laughs> I know. I couldn't believe you went Muncie. I went Muncie. I'm about power. This is a new age in baseball. We're all about uh, launch angle, getting it out of the ballpark. All right, second base. And we may mention another former natural turned Kansas City Royal here. I got to say the caveat, though, Jose Altuve was my first thought for second base. The, the little giant, the pequeño gigante, uh, my goodness, he was a revelation when he came through the league. He hit everything. Nobody could get him out. He's continued to hit the big leagues. Uh, the struggles a little bit this year, but uh, my gosh, I think he'll come out of it. But upon research, he never played a ball game at Dickey Stevens Park. So by my own criteria, Jose Altuve, ineligible to be our second baseman. So that opened things up, and you get uh, some variety here. I considered Colton Wong of the Cardinals, came through Springfield, great defender. Mike Moustakis, now playing second base with the Cincinnati Reds. I was a very good third baseman coming up through the league and obviously has some credentials. We go way back. Howie Kendrick had a legendary run with the Travs on the great 2005 team and has had a very productive big league career, including a World Series ring last year. But maybe the most underrated guy in all of baseball was my selection, Witt Merrifield. Played three seasons in the Texas League with Northwest Arkansas. Once he finally got to the big leagues, though, kind of became an overnight star. He's led the AL in hits each of the last two years, led in triples a season ago, played in every game. He's led the league in stolen bases twice. I mean, my gosh, the guy... All he does is put up numbers. He's playing outfield a lot this year, but uh, played second base previously. I've got Whit Merrifield as my second baseman for my all-star team. Mike, what do you think? Uh, I think it's a great choice, you know, and, and I just, I feel so bad for the people in, uh, in North Little Rock and in Little Rock. They didn't get the chance to, to watch Jose Altuve. How much? But, fun? you know, it's, it's not like they, they were, they were derelict or anything. He only played 30 some odd games, but, uh, but I, given his track, record and you know as you mentioned a slow start this year but uh, I, I think if, if he can keep it going this is a this is a future hall of famer in Altuve so uh with the four consecutive years of of, of uh, 200 plus hits you know six-time all-star you know he's a he's a big deal the former MVP award winner so uh, you know it's it's a it's 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 a an, another testament to the fact that it's these guys it's like lightning bolts you know when you want to catch them at the right time in this league uh, but yeah, for, for your purposes, for the fact that they have to play in, at, at uh, Dickey Stevens Park or at Way Winder, I think it's a good call. Andrew, did you think Colton Wong would become a, as elite a defender as he's become uh, after coming through Springfield? Well, in, in all fairness, he was here the year before I arrived. So that was still on Jeff Levering's watch. But I, I think everybody knew what he could do with the glove. And, and I think the main question has been his bat. You know, obviously he had a great year when he was in double A and, and he hit a lot in the minors. And, and that's shown up at times through the big leagues. But what I've really enjoyed watching, in addition to him finally getting some recognition with the gold glove last year, is how he's transformed himself as a hitter. You know, I think you get up there, and especially, as you mentioned a moment ago, it's all about power these days. 
And uh, I think he, along with so many guys, get up there and they try to hit home runs and, and do their best Barry Bonds. But he's, he's really transformed himself over the past couple of years to more of a contact approach. I think that showed up a lot last year uh, from a consistency basis of driving the ball up the middle and, and with his speed just trying to get on base, which is, um, you know, hopefully making a little bit of a return. In, in baseball. So it's been fun to watch him grow and develop and, and to still think he's, you know, he's not even 30 yet. He's been in the big leagues for seven years. Uh, yesterday, in fact, I think was his seven year anniversary of his call up. So, um, you know, he definitely, when you look at the career impact, I, I think he's got to be up there in, in the consideration. Howie Kendrick too. Um, I mean, his career numbers are, are pretty incredible. He, he spent so, so much time in L.A., and there were a couple of significant years, but I feel like if you're on that side of L.A., sometimes you get lost in the fold. Uh, but he's really had a consistent career, and he hit 344 for Washington last year. So, I mean, it's kind of like uh, it's tough to pick against Kendrick, but I, I'm going to agree with you. I'll, I'll go with Witt, too. I, he's just an awesome story. Um, I don't even think he started every day for the Naturals. If I remember correctly, he was kind of a utility guy on those teams uh, and, and would plug in everywhere. Um, but to see what he's, you know, you, you talk about turning yourself into a, a great big league hitter, to see what he's been able to turn himself into with the opportunity he's gotten in Kansas City is, is awesome. And he can do so many things from a, a defensive standpoint, speed, contact. Um, I think he had 10 triples last year, which I believe led the league. So, uh, I'll go with you on, on that former natural and, uh, and agree with you on Whitmer Merrifield. He'd be hitting leadoff. He was low enough on the totem pole for the naturals. He made a couple pitching appearances in his double-A career, including getting a save at Dickey Stevens Park one night. So second base, pretty loaded field there. Third base, I think, is the most loaded position on the diamond, though, for former Texas leaguers. You run through the list. We've got Josh Donaldson, who was a catcher when he came through the league and has just been outstanding in his big league career. Matt Chapman with the A's, another former Midland Rock Hound, and what he does with the glove, pretty good hitter as well. Alex Bregman speaks for himself there in Houston. Nolan Arenado with the Rockies. Back when Tulsa was a Rockies affiliate, Arenado played for the Drillers. Gene Segura has moved to third base now, the former Trav. That's five all-stars right there at third base. Incredible. This is the toughest position to pick. Guys, I went with Arenado just because, again, I think he gets underappreciated because the Rockies aren't in contention every day of every season. He's won the National League Home Run Championship three times, seven gold gloves at the hot corner, five All-Stars, three platinum gloves. The guy's a walking highlight reel. He can hit. But I'd take him, Bregman, Chapman, Donaldson, any of those guys on my team any day. Andrew, you got to see Arenado a lot uh, coming up through the minors as well. Do you take him or do you lean to one of these other guys uh, as the guy you'd want at the hot corner? Yeah, it's it's funny. I saw Arenado and Story and, and a bunch of those guys when I was in the South Atlantic League. They were all coming up through Asheville. And uh, the, the ballpark in Asheville, North Carolina, is built into the side of a mountain, literally. And so the walls, the dimensions are really, really short all the way around, but they built the walls up high. It's like having a green monster, you know, in every direction. <laughs> it was a lot of fun watching those guys tee off and, and intentionally, I mean, they just hit moonshots. They probably only went 370 feet, but uh, they were they were flying up home runs um, into the mountainside, which was a lot of fun. But I would go Arenado. I agree with you. I, I mean, he's one of what the top maybe five best players in baseball, um, and and one of the best third basemen that I think any of us are ever going to see. So uh, I would go Arenado. But I agree with you. This list is incredible. Matt Chapman um, was one of the best players I've seen in person. I think, uh, and we only being in the North, we only got to see him a handful of times since he was in Midland. Alex Bregman is a superstar already and will be for, for the next decade. Um, the, only, the only bone of contention I had with your list uh, was a little bit of a snub for our boy here, Matt Carpenter, who, uh, if nothing else, from a career standpoint, I know the defensive side at third base you know, might not be up to the level of an Arenado, uh, but he's hit a lot of home runs and he's hit a lot of doubles in his career and, and being a left-handed bat too. So... Uh, I, I might I might lobby to get Carp on the also considered list, but I think I would go Arenado with you. 
I think if we ask Cardinals Nation right now, though, based on last season and this year, Matt Carpenter might be down the list a little bit. But I know he is still beloved. And to, to be honest, Mike, you didn't see those guys as much because they were in the North. But my memories of Matt Carpenter in the Texas League versus Nolan Arenado was Carpenter was a better player. You could see the potential with Arenado, but the hype didn't seem to match what he did on a daily basis. Whereas with Carpenter, he just went out and crushed. Same for some of the guys like Bregman and Donaldson. But uh, who do you have at third base? I, I got to go Arenado. I, I, I think, you know, and I hate to bring it out every time. I think he's a future Hall of Famer given what he's done and, and, and given the fact that, you know, that the output is still there for him. But my takeaway is just the gluttony, uh, the, the glut of, of, of talent at this position. You know, uh, Matt Chapman is a, a tremendous choice. Obviously, I'm, I'm partial to guys like Alex Bregman. You, you left off my boy, J.D. Davis. You know, I know it's still a very infinite, uh, you know, very er, early in his career, but uh, he's putting some things together. He was in left field. Now he's, now he's back at, at third base for the Mets. But uh, I, it's tough to argue. Uh, with with uh, with Arenado and just looking at back and looking at Do Donaldson's numbers uh, it's just crazy to think about the talent that has run through this league you guys have had some yeah. in Corpus Christi and we're going to name a few more here coming up but you guys have been pretty good you just haven't won a championship well we the the hooks have been too good they've been so good that that come September nobody's left uh, and I think the Astros are, are just they're, I think they're happy with that I think they're okay all right, so we're in agreement. Yeah, the Astros have been fine in October, although I will, I will save that debate for another day. <laughs> but let's move on to shortstop after we agree on Nolan Arenado, the former Tulsa driller at third base. Shortstop, kind of like third base. There's a lot of guys to choose from here, but the quality doesn't really match the quantity. And I'll be honest, guys, I really struggled to pick the shortstop for this team because there were so many guys I considered. And I think maybe by the end of this season, my vote's going to change. Now, again, one of the criteria I put on this was I wanted every team represented, kind of like the big league all-star teams have to have one player off every team. I wanted at least one guy from every Texas League franchise. Now, Amarillo's only been in existence one year, so I went San Antonio slash Amarillo. So this guy counts for my San Antonio mission on the team. I went with Trey Turner at shortstop. Again, got a ring last year with the Washington Nationals. Very limited time in the Texas League, and it was kind of an odd circumstance as he'd already been agreed to be traded from the Padres to the, the Nationals organization. So he was limited in how much they played him in San Antonio for half a season. He's led the National League in steals, but it was tough to pick Turner over guys like Elvis Andrews, Paul Young, who really exploded after getting to the big leagues with St. Louis, Corey Seager. I um, mean, my gosh, he's really good. Trevor Story, really good. And the guy I think that might end up being better than all of them, Fernando Tatis Jr., who, uh, you know, 19 when he shows up in the Texas League a couple years ago. Third game of the year, he's hitting a go-ahead homer in the ninth inning against the Travs at Dickey Stevens Park. The guy's special. He's starting to show that here in 2020. Shortstop, tough position. Uh, I went Turner to meet the criteria of getting somebody from that San Antonio franchise, but uh, I think you could pick some other guys. Mike, uh, which way do you lean? Well, I, I totally agree with you on on Tatis and and what's in store for him later on down in his career. And uh, Trey Turner was obviously a tremendous talent. Loved watching him during his limited time with the missions. But you didn't even list Correa. Is Correa on on the also considered? You know, I thought about him a little bit, but maybe it's just bias because he's in a lineup with Springer, Altuve, Bregman on a nightly basis. Yeah, you know, his, his issue has yeah, been Correa staying on the field. I should have. But when, when this guy is on the field and healthy, uh, he is, I mean, just a tremendous force, just just in terms of what he does defensively alone and the pop that, and, and he's been at the bottom of the order for, for the most part. So let me, let me throw this, this at you. This is a contract year for, uh, for, uh, for Carlos Correa, free agent after this season. Sure. And he's already off to a, a tremendous start. I think he's almost hitting 300. Uh, so I, this is a guy that I would certainly watch out for as well. I would, I would have at least listed him, Stephen. Uh, you're right. I should have thrown him on the list. I bypassed him. Let me ask you this question, Mike, since you saw these Corpus Christi guys on a daily basis. Altuve, Bregman, Correa, Springer. We'll get to J.D. Martinez, Jordan Alvarez in a little bit. Who's the best hitter you've seen on a daily basis wearing a Corpus Christi uniform? I, for me personally, and, and given the fact that I, I, I would say Altuve, but it was a very short sample size, and I will credit my predecessor, Matt Hicks, who called it immediately, said that Altuve was the best player in the league after about a week of seeing him, just with the rate of the, the hard contact, the line drives, just tremendous. But I would say Alex Bregman, to, to answer that question. Okay. In terms of 
of the best pure hitter, best hitter for power, best hitter for average. Andrew, what do you think about the shortstop position? Pretty loaded, but maybe not quite as much quality as third base. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that there's some pretty good quality here. I, uh, Paul DeYoung, you know, near, near and dear to our hearts here at Hammonds Field, is probably fourth on the list as I go through this. <laughs> and that's a 30 home run guy. He was an all That says a lot. Yes. You know, but I, I think – I don't know how you could pick anybody uh, over Tatis right now. And, and I'm not saying that against you, Stephen. I know you did it in the offseason. But just as we sit here right now, I mean, the, you know, the word that Michael used a, a couple moments ago of, a, of lightning bolt, he's like the human lightning bolt right now where, um, you know, I, I've watched more Padres games <laughs> this year. Granted, we've had a little time on our hands in the Texas League. But, uh, you know, I, I've tuned into those games just because that team is so fun to watch, and he's such a huge part of that. So I, I might have to go Tatis. I'm a huge uh, back to my Sally League days and watching him crush against my Hickory Crawdads years ago. I'm a huge Trevor Story fan. I think if he's playing for a different team, you know, if he's the shortstop for the New York Yankees, for example, he's one of the top maybe 10 for sure players in baseball. I think he gets a little lost on that team. And, and I've got another one as we go into the outfield in, in that department. But the Rockies, and I know you have the mile high effect and, and some altitude, but what he can do, I, I think, is pretty incredible. Um, and so I would probably go Story and Tatis as my top two uh, with Corey Seager um, really close to that echelon as well. I think Trey Turner is a fine choice, especially, you know, trying to be judicious and, and make sure every team has a representative. And I understand that. And I mean, you can't go wrong with that speed and defensive ability, but the, the bats of Tatis and story, I think would, would win out for me. Tatis would fill that criteria as well. If we do indeed end up flipping and we'll revisit this in the off season. This may or may not show up in the Travs game day program next year. All We're right. Showing up in the hooks game day program. I know that for a fact now. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great well, exercise. All right, let's move to the outfield. Uh, one spot was very obvious. Talk about near and dear to your hearts. When the, the best player in baseball comes through your franchise, everybody in Trav's nation wants to know what Mike Trout's doing on a daily basis. So we've got Mike Trout in the outfield. We forget he was only 19 when he played for the Travs and came through the Texas League and was catching everything that didn't land in the Arkansas River uh, and hitting triples. And it seemed like he always came to bat in a big spot, always delivered. But I think the best description I got of Mike Trout from an opposing player was that every time you saw him, he got better at something. And what's crazy now is a decade later, almost, people are still saying that about him in the big leagues. You don't see him for a few months. You play him again. He's better at something. He just keeps getting better. So I've got Mike Trout, best player in baseball, maybe the greatest traveler of all time already in the outfield. Guy's not even 30 years old. Cody Bellinger's playing first base a little more this year again for the Dodgers and played first base when he came through the league with Tulsa. But I've got Cody Bellinger in the outfield. He did win a gold glove out there last year. And for my third outfielder to fill the uh, Frisco Rough Riders spot on the team, I went Joey Gallo. We need some more power. We need a guy down towards the bottom of the lineup who's a big threat, sneaky athletic, 40-plus homers two years in a row. And if not for the injury last year, I think he was just going to totally break out, and the batting average was going to be up two to match the power. So my outfield is Trout, Bellinger, Gallo. Looking back on it, though, Andrew, I can't believe I left off Charlie Blackman and couldn't find a spot for him, and now he's hitting well over 400 this season. And, hey, put an asterisk by it if you want in a 60-game season if he gets it done, but still, go get it, Charlie Blackman. Also thought yeah. about Tommy Pham, who's now with the Padres after bouncing around a little bit. And obviously, George Springer, who was a star for the half season, he was in this league. Uh, you, you got some good options here in the outfield. Mike, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with you on, on, on this list. I think it's very good for the outfield. But the, the, the biggest thing for me was Charlie Blackman. Uh, obviously, this year, just incredible 22 RBIs and 22 ball games, hitting 446. But uh, with the track record, you know, an all star in four of the last six campaigns. Uh, a tremendous talent. And, and I guess the biggest takeaway for me uh, for this list is that, yeah, I kind of got the Jose Altuve syndrome because, you know, the good folks in Corpus Christi only got to see a precious two games of, of Mike Trout uh, back in 2011. So uh, it's, it got kind of goes to show you how much of a crapshoot it is when you get to watch these guys, but uh, that's a, that's a pretty salty list right there. Trout, Bellinger and Gallo. 
to that point, I think it, it speaks to the fact that folks, if you want to see these stars, get season tickets and be ready to come out to the ballpark yes. tonight, see what's going on, pay attention, uh, listen to the, the folks who are talking about this because these guys might be stars. And, and, you know, when a guy like Mike Trout does come through, you better go see him while he's there. Uh, Jose Altuve might not come back. Better go see him while he's there. Andrew, uh, were you referencing Charlie Blackman for the outfield as the guy you'd have in there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's uh, – I think the same thing about Trevor's story applies to Charlie Blackman. He would be a household name even more than, than arguably he already is if he didn't play in Colorado. Um, I, I, I looked – through his career numbers, and I, I don't think I have him up right now, but, I mean, he's just been so consistent. He's a career 300 hitter with power, RBIs, doubles, everything. Um, so I would go Blackman over Gallo. Again, I understand what you're doing with, with getting Frisco in the mix. Um, and Frisco's had some, some great players, too, that have gone through there. Uh, for years, the Rangers had the top farm system in baseball. Um, and, and then, you know, things either didn't pan out or they, they made some trades. But – uh, Gallo is really exciting. He's one of those guys, I, I think, at any moment, um, you never know what he's going to do. I know he hit one uh, a couple years ago against us when we were in Frisco that cleared uh, everything in right field. I mean, it, it crossed the street, almost hit the, the condos out there. It was just an incredible home run. So, um, yeah, he's definitely definitely worthy of that spot. I, I would go Blackman, though. Um, maybe, it's, maybe I'm a, a closet Rockies fan. <laughs> as we're finding out through this. Um, <laughs> I would also say Tommy Pham, I, I, I just wish that we could have seen Tommy Pham without injuries because when he was healthy um, and, and everything was kind of going on on the right track for him when he would be in Springfield on and off, he's one of the best players that I've ever seen in person in, in the minor leagues. He can absolutely take over a game. Um, Maybe the only, and, and I mean, it's the only area of his game that might be uh, that might be a little bit behind some of these other names is his arm strength. But the ground that he can cover, especially if he's not in center field, he's about the best left fielder out there. Um, and so I, I would I would give Tommy some strong consideration. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've got to go Blackman as that third to go, and, and the two, the first two are no doubters to to me as well. It's it's Trout for sure in the Bellinger. If we've got a yeah, I, I think you had to to include Frisco there, right? That was the the main uh, reasoning the for Gallo. For Gallo, if we go with a bigger team, we might be able to sneak up another pitcher from Frisco in there. But for the purposes of this, had to go Gallo. Besides, if we've got a Trout Bellinger outfield, we could have a statue playing in the other spot, and we'd be okay. <laughs> Very true. All right, designated hitter Andrew. We're going to leave you out of this. Cardinals, you guys don't use the DH all the time. And besides, the only two guys I considered for the DH spot, Mike, are former Corpus Christi Hooks. Former Hooks. J.D. Martinez, who the Astros gave up on, he revamps his swing, goes to Detroit, and explodes there with the Tigers, now with the Boston Red Sox, and then the rookie phenom a year ago, who's just out of Corpus Christi and off the Astros' alternate site roster now and back to the big leagues, and homered in his first at bat back, of course, Jordan Alvarez. Where do you go? Martinez, Alvarez, do you go longevity? Do you I think you got to go longevity here uh, with, with J.D. Martinez and an incredible story. And it's funny when you, you know, you mentioned the Astros let him go and they did that. Sometimes you just need to, to find some, some different scenery and, and J.D. did that and, and so much more, but you talk to some of the guys that he played with and even your buddy, uh, Stephen and Jimmy Van Ostrand, you know, they saw it even there in Corpus Christi, just his work ethic and how committed he was to his swing. And I think when you put that, that discipline along with his talent, you, you know, it's a, that's a pretty darn good recipe. And we've seen that from him. Uh, Jordan Alvarez certainly has the talent. It's just a matter of, can he, can he sustain it? Coming off an historic year last year, one of three Astros to win the, uh, the rookie of the year award. So uh, a tremendous guy, and, and you're done. And you know he he had missed all that time this year. Came back in his first swing, first at bat, he had belted an opposite field home run, much like his first big league home run last year. So, uh, but the question for him is is staying on the field and staying healthy. You know he's been mired by these these uh, chronic knee injuries, and that's that has him out of the lineup currently. So I think with your Don, the potential is there. He's just gotta he's gotta get out there and play. All right, I have Martinez as well as my DH. I think we've got a pretty good lineup, and you can put guys like Merrifield and Trout at the top. you got the Bellingers, the Arenados, the Muncies of the world, the Martinez hitting the middle of the lineup. We're going to score plenty of runs. But 
As we all know, baseball is all about pitching. So I limited it to two starting pitchers and two relievers for our team. I think starting pitching, when you talk Texas League alums, top end is outstanding. Maybe the depth isn't quite there. We'd have a problem getting through the fifth spot, having a sixth guy ready to go. But for the two guys up top, I've got, I know he's young, but boy, Jack Flaherty is as good as anybody yeah. right now. Uh, and he was really good when he was in Springfield a couple years ago as well. I don't think any of us are surprised to see what he's doing and as quickly as he's done it. And then I went old school, and I've got Zach Grinke for the other spot. He just keeps doing it. He's on, what, his fifth or sixth team right now. He's got the Cy Young. He's got the gold gloves. He can hit if we don't use the DH, uh, and I know Zach would like to. Plus, he played at Ray Winder Field. we got to have a guy who was at Ray Winder on there. But we got some other talent as well. Sonny Gray came through Midland. He's still going. Corey Kluber's got a Cy Young. He was in San Antonio a couple years. Lance Lynn. Sean Newcomb, now with the Braves, was with the Travs. Julio Urias, so we've been hearing about him, I think, since he was a preteen coming up through the Dodgers system. Uh, he's finally starting to get his feet under him now in the big leagues. But for me, it, it's Flaherty, Grinky, and then, uh, you know what, if we need to pray for rain, but I'll take my top two against anybody if I got those guys. Uh, Andrew, I know you really loved having Jack Flaherty in Springfield. <laughs> yeah, back in 2017 uh, was our last exhibition game against St. Louis here at Hammonds Field. And, um, you know, during exhibition games, there's sort of some unwritten rules. You know, everybody's trying, but mostly just trying not to get hurt right before the, the real season starts. And Springfield in April, it's normally cold. If we have the Cardinals in town, that means it's going to be raining too. I, I don't know if it was raining at this time, but it was definitely a chilly April evening. And so, you know, you don't really put defensive shifts on. You don't do those, those kinds of things in an exhibition game. Um, and so with Jack on the mound, and Jack had a great start against St. Louis. I think it was five or six innings and, and either maybe one or, or no runs allowed. It, it really was just sort of an, an incredible start to his year. Well, Dexter Fowler, who had just signed in the offseason, uh, got on. And he's taken a little lead away from first base. Nobody's stealing in an exhibition game. You know, nobody's running. No hit and runs. So Dex is kind of edging away from first base, and all of a sudden Flaherty whips around and fires a bullet <laughs> over to first, trying to pick off Fowler. And, uh, and you know, Fowler, all you have to do is watch, watch five minutes of a game on TV to know that Dexter Fowler's got a great personality. So he kind of stood up, <laughs> and he gave, he gave Flaherty a, a little bit of like, a, what's going on? You know, what are we doing out here? Uh, but that really just tells you all you need to know about Jack. He, he's got he's got an incredible competitive streak. He doesn't really care what month the game is in. Um, he's trying to win every pitch when he's out there on the mound. And you know, I think that that attitude, obviously combined with tremendous talent, but that uh, that drive and and that focus and intensity is probably all that that's combined for his meteoric rise uh, to to really a superstar level so early on. Yeah, he, he's definitely a young gun in the big leagues. Should mention one other young gun who, who's great for the Dodgers. Maybe doesn't get the attention he deserves because he's not the top top of their rotation with Clayton Kershaw, but Walker Bueller, who's been sensational, never actually pitched in Little Rock. Uh, every time the, the drillers, when he was with Tulsa and the Travs matched up and he was on the mound for whatever reason, it was in Tulsa. Two or three times uh, Bueller faced the Travs, but it was always on a road game for the Travs. So by my criteria, by my own fault, Walker Bueller ineligible for this team. So uh, we may see some more of those arms that came through Tulsa the last year or two eventually getting onto this list as we keep updating. But for starters right now, I've got Jack Flaherty, Zach Greinke as my guys with uh, some, hopefully some solid depth behind them. So we'll move on to the relief pitchers now. Whoa, 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 wait. I, I don't get any starting pitching input or what? I no. had like 15 minutes prepared. <laughs> I guess not. Do you want to launch into something about the starters, Mike? No, that's good. You, you okay. guys covered it well. We'll go to you first here on the relievers because the first guy on my list is a guy you had in Corpus Christi who's become maybe as dominant as anybody in recent memory in the big leagues in Josh Hader, a lefty now at the Milwaukee Brewers. You had him for parts of two seasons with the hooks. It just puts up ridiculous numbers. And my second reliever is Will Smith, former Trav, former natural, traded from the Angels to the Royals uh, during his minor league career was a starting pitcher at the time and actually threw the first seven innings of a combined no-hitter when he was with the Naturals in a ball game at Dickey Stevens Park. Uh, so special mention for Will Smith being on the list. Also thought of another lefty, Sean Doolittle, who spent a lot more time in the Texas League playing first base for the Midland Rockhounds than he did pitching after being converted. Ione Kayla, Jose LeClerc, both of whom spent time with Frisco, and then Adam Adovino, 
way back, long time ago, 2008, was a starter with Springfield before converting to the bullpen and is now dominant for the Yankees. But, uh, Mike, let's start with you. Josh Hader, uh, was he what you thought he could be in Corpus Christi, what he is now? You know, I, I didn't see 16 strikeouts per nine, you know, in the big leagues. And, and the fact that he's been so darn reliable for the Brewers and the numbers say it all couple all-star uh, nods in his last last two seasons. So I think you, you hit the uh, the nail right on the head with Josh Hader. And um, he's just – he's one of the guys that, that really is is the elite, you know, relievers in the big leagues right now. And it's it's nice that he's a former hook. Nice that he played at uh, Dickey Stevens Park in North Little Rock. A, a note I will add to this is that uh, Chris Davinsky, also a very good reliever. He's had, he's had some, some injury issues lately. Uh, but this guy was nails for the Astros when he came up and was actually a, a pitcher of the year for the Astros after his initial season. But, you know, uh, it, Devo and Josh Hader combined for the only no hitter in Hook's history at Dickey Stevens Park uh, in North Little Rock. It was a rain shortened no-no and Devo threw five and two third, I believe. And then Hader came on, got the last out. And then the, then the skies just came open and it started pouring raining. And Chris Davinsky was helping the, the tarp crew get the tarp on the field during that, during that rain delay, which ended up, you know, uh, cutting the, the game short uh, after throwing, you know, five and two-third no-hit frames. So that's all you need to know about Devo right there. Awesome. I know he's one of your personal favorites, too. Great stuff on those guys. Yeah, I didn't mention Davinsky, but he had a really good run. Hasn't been quite as good lately. Because... Right. To your point, this year, I, I think you hit it right, though, with, with Smith and, and Hayter for sure. Andrew, I want to ask you, I know Adovino was way before your time in Springfield. Even Will Smith was before your time in the league. But so many guys come up through the minors as starters, and we go, yeah, that guy might have a chance. And then we forget that, hey, two, three years down the road, you can move him to the bullpen, and they can become dominant. A lot of guys end up taking that route. Yeah, they do. And, and I think it's kind of fun because every, every team seems to have a little bit of a different philosophy on developing their pitchers and, and piecing together their pitching staffs. Um, you know, you, you have the haters of the world that come through as relievers and, and sometimes guys are drafted and, and there's no question maybe they were a reliever already in college. Uh, but I know at least here in, in Springfield, uh, oftentimes the St. Louis Cardinals bullpen is made up of guys who were starters coming through the minors um, kind of like an out of veto, uh, you know, pretty much everybody on that 2012 pitching staff that won the, the Texas League championship here had been a starter and then wound up in St. Louis um, really the next year even uh, as bullpen help. Alex Reyes right now has sort of followed that path. Um, you know, so I think that happens a lot, even, even in Adam Wainwright, who moved back to the rotation, obviously, but he, he broke in, um, you know, as a, as a, obviously as a closer and as a reliever, uh, on those championship teams for St. Louis when he was, uh, you know, when he was just a rookie. So, um, it is sort of interesting to see the guys that, that we watch every day, uh, and Chris Dubinsky is a good example, uh, who was a dominant starter, uh, in Corpus and, and has transitioned into a great reliever, but, to to watch the roles that guys end up growing into. And, and sometimes it's out of necessity because it's a better fit for them as pitchers. Sometimes it's just because that's what the need was as well in the big leagues. Um, but to, to watch those guys, to, to see what roles they end up filling. And it also, I think the bullpen guys are kind of fun too, because a, a lot of times they move around a lot more, mm -hmm. um, you know, so you, you get that journeyman aspect and, and, um, it's fun sometimes to, to track it back. You know, I don't know if a lot of people think of Adam Adovino as a Cardinal. You know, he's, he's had such a good career in Colorado, now the Yankees and, and, and so many other teams. But to, to sort of track his origin back here to Springfield is, is fun. I like it as well. Gentlemen, this has been a blast today. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the stories. How are you guys doing? You holding up okay watching baseball? And uh, Andrew, you said you've been watching Padres games or whoever's on. You guys – Doing all right as we uh, await, hopefully, a, a more normal 2021 and a, a Texas League season for us? Yeah, yeah, we're doing well. You know, definitely a lot of time, uh, a lot of time at home, which is nice. It's kind of nice to, to have a little bit of a slowdown despite the circumstances. Um, so, yeah, it's been fun watching some teams we normally don't get to watch because we're, we're consumed by Texas League baseball in an, in an average year. So to get to watch some of those teams, especially some of the West Coast teams, I think, uh, you know, has, has been a lot of fun. Um, my yard looks great, uh, about as good as, as it ever has. It's green, and it's, what, August 17th, and it, I actually have green out there. So 
You're a magician. Um, you know, there have been some positives, but uh, yeah, like you said, can't wait for April and and uh, and the return of Texas League baseball. Mike, you doing all right down south on the bay? My my yard is a mess. I feel like my internal you know progress and development has been stunted. I'm just I'm in a bad place. If it wasn't for my family, I'd be completely lost. So I'm I'm ready for for April 2021 for sure. All right. Sounds good. Well, we will see you guys hopefully before April 2021, but thanks for the time. Michael Coffin, Corpus Christi Hooks, Andrew Buckbinder of the Springfield Cardinals. That's Trav's talk for this week. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back with you next week.